my kids you. throw books on the floor and I'm like, you can't throw a book, how dare you? Don't throw a book. Yeah, I'm always picking the like emotional moving one. She's like, flap, flap. Yeah. Okay, ready? Yeah. yeah. So hello, um, I'm Natasha Lunn, author of Conversations on Love. Um, and it is a book about how we find love, how we sustain love, and how we survive when we lose love. And, and the aim of the project is really to expand our understanding of love and to look at more ways we can prioritise it and pay more attention to it. Which is why I'm so excited to be interviewing Fern Cotton today. So I've been following your work for some time and I know that you are such a curious thinker and you've been asking a lot of these big questions yourself in all of your work. Um, and now, excitingly, particularly about love in your new book, Bigger Than Us. Can you just tell us briefly what it's about? So Bigger Than Us, I guess, is about spirituality although I feel I sort of say that word um, with some trepidation because it, it can be quite off-putting and I I understand why because I think sometimes the word spirituality then extracts it and makes it something entirely different over here I just think spirituality is life it's that simple it's kind of it's life and it's how we show up every day and how we see the world and how we move through it so this book was my attempt at looking at lots of different practices and theories and ways of thinking about life and connection and meaning in this sort of very messy world that we live in. But it's hopefully going to help us all feel a bit more connected to find more meaning in the good bits, but also the really messy bits of life as well. So you write about this in the book, but I wonder if you can just reflect on it a bit now, which is how your relationship to love or your understanding of it has changed because it's been on a bit of a big journey. <laughs> yes. So, so <laughs> where it started out maybe like early 20s and then what, <sighs> how you, what the word means to you now. Yeah, so I think love, it's got all different flavours, I guess. But love to me in my early 20s, there was the family love, which I'm very lucky to have and had at that point in my life. Then there was the sort of friendship love. But the focus for me at that point was on romantic love. And romantic love to me then meant all in. It was like high octane, high flying, you know, end of a movie. That was what I was looking for, that kind of love. And anything else I was like, boring, don't want to know. So that obviously got me into some like really tricky situations and a lot of unrequited love and a lot of being dumped and a lot of feeling um, like there was something wrong with me because I would just throw everything at it. I had no boundaries. I had no understanding that I could hold things back for myself. Um, I found it really, really confusing. And I think over time, I'm probably a bit more, I don't know if it's pragmatic about love, but I probably understand it through experience. And I've now got the delicious love of, uh, from my children that I receive and give and that's got a whole other flavour to it but I think with my husband and now being sort of 10 years well 11 years actually into a relationship it's not I'm not looking for that sort of intense you know movie star love that's probably tinged much more with lust than it is love anyway I'm looking for genuine companionship and shared experience and feeling safe I think is a big part of it I don't mm. think safety had any connection to love in my 20s whereas now I want to feel really safe and luckily I do which I feel very grateful for but is there also because um a line that stood out to me where you you said that spir spirituality is a promise to love and I was wondering how you know a big part of what you're writing about now is like finding more meaning in life and being more open to spirituality and I wonder if being more in touch with your spiritual side has made you more open to different forms of love, you know, love in nature or, or love in with strangers or not just kind of the romantic and familial love? I guess it becomes more expansive and you don't actually need to box it off into family love, friend love, nature love. I think there's just, you can just feel it sometimes. It could be mm. when I'm doing a podcast and I'm in a deep conversation with someone, there's just this delicious feeling that rises up from within and you know it's there and I think that's probably that you know the tapping into universal love which is omnipresent doesn't always feel like it we can really sideline that stuff and not take any note of it but I think that omnipresent universal love is there for us all to tap into but due to circumstance experience whatever we're going through sometimes it feels like there's no love around me there's no opportunity for me to feel any love here. It's gone. I have, I'm void of love, but it is always there. And you know, in the book, I'm just trying to find 
tools and very sort of a lot of the time the very ancient sort of esoteric practices that enable all of us to have access to that love anytime we want any time in the day even in moments of total despair and pain to to eat just to be aware that it's still there it's always mm. there but it's the ego isn't it that gets in the way yeah. of that yeah and, hugely but and the kind of self-love is a big topic that comes up for you and you write very movingly and honestly about lacking self-love at Hugely. certain points. And, and I was really interested because I think a lot of us look externally, you know, we look to find a relationship with somebody else hoping that that make, might make us like mm. ourselves more. But I was interested that you had the added thing of TV and, and maybe looking to get people to like you there in order for you to love yourself. And yes. I wonder when you realised that neither of those options were going to work <laughs> like recently like really mm. recently I think the writing of the books helped me look delve more deeply into that I think being on TV also from such a young age has forced me to look at that dynamic and that relationship of exterior noise and how that impacts my own self-worth and through not so much my teens because I was naive enough just to be like loving the job and going with it but in my 20s I was impacted so badly by outside noise and I took everything as sort of fact so all opinion became translated as fact you know I am this I am not good at that I am awful at this and I lugged that around with me for years and it gradually chipped away at my confidence and self-worth right into my 30s more so in my 30s because I was sort of mentally not feeling great and then probably the last couple of years I've really dared to take a look at that. Like, why have I been, why have I been doing that? Why have I taken on everybody's expectations of me or opinions of me, taken them on as fact, and then chosen to sort of act from that place? And those opinions then start to inform my own decision-making. Why am I doing that? So there's not one clear answer to that question. That's just involved a lot of self-inventory and a willingness to try new things and do things differently and think differently. But now, over the last couple of years, I'm definitely getting to a place where, in a perhaps post-40 cliche way, I do care less about outside opinion. Um, and I'm, I'm much more interested in having a decent relationship with myself. Mm. Because I think for a lot of the time, I wasn't. And most of us aren't. We're just carried away with people pleasing and making dynamics feel easier, but we lose all relationship with ourselves. Mm. And it feels uncomfortable and awkward and like, oh, who am I and how do I, and how do I like myself? And I'm not even looking to find bits of myself I like, oh, I can like myself because I did this well or I, whatever. It's just a foundation of acceptance of, okay, that might have gone wrong or looking at the past, whatever, but a feeling of some love th that's there. And I'm, I'm more interested in cultivating that and looking at that more closely than I am worried about, oh, I hope everybody likes me and everyone thinks I'm great because that's impossible. Also, it's impossible. funny that you, would, you were hoping you would find the self-love there if other people, but actually it did the opposite. It does the absolute opposite. And I think, you know, I see it play out a lot because you can see it on social media or with influencers or people just in the public eye. You can... And I've done it loads of times where you can see that they, they want to feel accepted. And that's only because they don't, they're not accepting themselves. And, and mm. I've so been there. But I think when you realise that it, that is futile, you're never going to get that deep feeling of self-acceptance and self-love from other people. It's so flimsy. That sort of, you might feel it for like half an hour, like, oh, I feel a bit good about myself because everyone's saying I'm great. It takes one nasty comment for that to just evaporate immediately. Yeah, it's it's so flimsy. So I think through lots and lots of years of trial and error with that one, I've realised it doesn't work. And the only way I can get self-acceptance is to do the work and to keep trying. It's not like, oh, I've done self-acceptance now. I can move on through the rest of my life peacefully. Every day I have to go, oh, God, that was a bit crap. I went a bit wrong there. But um, it's OK. I'm, I'm all right. I'm still OK. I'm here. I'm very grateful for my life. I'm fine. And it's just daily practice to keep going back to that place of acceptance, I guess. I mean, I did feel exhausted at points when you talk about like doing the school run, texting a friend who you didn't reply to the day before, oh. just the morning of like, just the admin of your life. And you were saying at one point, it can just feel like you're just racing to get to the end of each day. And I wonder from all these people who you've spoken to, if you now have found any way to just 
be more meaningfully, be kind of with the people you love in a more meaningful way than just sort of trying to fast forward through each day and, and reach the finishing line and get to bed. Yeah, definitely. Not always. Like last night, I did not manage that at all. And I was in the kitchen, the kids were asleep, and my husband said, you, your eyes look wild. Like, what are you doing? And I was like manically voice noting people because I hadn't texted anyone back for a week just because it hadn't been a priority to do that because I had so much on with the kids and work that I thought I will get around to it at some point. But then I was feeling all this guilt. They probably don't think I, you know, I um, think much of their fr our friendship or whatever. I don't value their friendship. So I was voice noting like back to back. Hey, sorry, I haven't got back to you. Hey, sorry. And he was like, what are you <laughs> doing? He went, go to bed. You lunatic. You're exhausted. So at times I don't manage it and my husband is luckily like the backup who comes in like blowing a whistle. Woo, what are you doing? Go to bed and he'll like tell me off. Um, but I do think I am better at say like when I'm doing the kids bedtime. I'm exhausted like most parents, whatever you've been doing, working or not, you're bloody knackered. And all you're thinking is Eva, I just want to get on the sofa and watch TV or I just want to get in bed. And I had before sort of tried to rush through that a bit and now I'm just trying to go, right, I am bloody knackered and they aren't listening to me and they're not getting in bed. But when they're 18, I'm going to miss this so much. Mm. And I'm going to look back at this era where they've got their cuddly toys and I'm sniffing their little heads and they're all gorgeous and cute and they want to hug me and they want to kiss me on the lips. And, and I'm just trying to be more present and grateful in those moments rather than I just want to get to bed. Because invariably, when you're sat there on the so for watching TV after that, you don't feel a sense of relief or any better. You're already thinking about, what the hell am I doing tomorrow? How am I going to get through all this stuff? So I'm trying to not fast forward too much to this next thing I've got to tick off a list. And I'm definitely attempting, I think it goes back to awareness, being aware of the moments when that happens also and calling it out. It reminds me of like when you give yourself over to the moment rather than trying to rush it, it just, it kind of makes it, calm or it changes the tone of the moment doesn't it, it reminds yeah. me of one woman I've interviewed whose husband was very sick said she had to bath him and he couldn't move and you know she was just get so frustrated it was difficult and when she said to herself this might take three hours yeah but I'm going to give myself over to it then it just it made her feel less tense it made her feel less unhappy in the moment but I think particularly with the kid with the kid stuff like the admin and the chaos <laughs> and the sort of intensity of that is a lot of other forms of love, <clears throat> romantic, familial, self, like friendship, can get lost in that. Yep. So, and that's something that I feel I'm wrestling with all the time at the moment. I wanted to ask you, I guess, first of all, how you think becoming a parent has changed your understanding of love or what it's taught you about love, but then also what you've learned about trying not to lose all those other forms of love in this intense, all-consuming chaos. I think there again has to be an acceptance that it will change and that some things will slide a bit because you can't do it all. It's literally impossible. And like the biggest thing that has slid away for me is um, my social life. I don't, mm. I don't really have one, but I'm absolutely fine with that. I love being with my family and I absolutely love my job and they're my priorities. So, But there's a real difference, isn't there, between social life and friendships? Yeah, so I still, my friendships are very dear to me, but they've changed shape. Mm. Luckily, like, so my best friends are the people I went to school with. So there's six of us, we all grew up together. Wow. And um, out of the six of us, um, all but one have had kids. So we've all gone through that together and have all sort of gone, wow, this is intense. And we're probably not all going to be seeing each other as much as we did prior to having kids. But now when we do, it's so amazing. So we all went away for the night for my 40th. Oh. And we were all just sort of, none of us slept because we were all like, oh my God, are the kids sleeping? What's going on at home? And we couldn't quite switch off, but we were all sort of laughing about it. And we swam in the sea and we drank red wine and it was even more special because it's not as regular. But then also, if I'm really honest, you know, some friendships aren't as solid as they were before. Mm. I think it, it it can work beautifully. Like one of my best mates, Kai, he hasn't got kids and our friendship is exactly the same. We mess about, we're really silly together, 
we can have really deep chats and we have big walks and deep chats and we've been friends since we were kids and nothing's changed. Whereas there have been friendships where I'm in a different sort of part of my life, I guess, and we've just sort of gone like that. And yeah. I think, you know, that will happen. It might not always, but it might happen. And I don't know what the answer is to how you rectify that or if you just have acceptance and some peace about it. But my priorities, and I'm quite open about it, so I will tell people, you know, I'm not, I'm probably not going to come to your party because I'm absolutely exhausted. And if I do, I'm going to tip over the edge and I'm not mentally going to feel great. But I would love to have lunch with you another time, just me and you. And sometimes that goes down like a sack of shit, if I'm honest, and mm. people don't want to hear that. But I can't be anything other than I am right now, which is sort of slightly overwhelmed mum, like so many others out there. So I've just learned to be a bit more honest and sometimes the reaction to that isn't great. I don't think it's like all magic and fairy tales. I think sometimes it is just a bit shit. Yeah, but with your friendships who are so important to you and, and you've managed to retain something even if you don't see them, how do you think, how, how have you changed the way you are with them in order to sort of, I mean, I guess one therapist said to me that placeholders are really important. So like when she was writing her book, even just rather than disappearing, saying to her friend, I'm just not going to be able to see you for three months because I'm a bit dead but I really love you and I'm just mm. going to send you a message. Even rather than just feeling the guilt, just kind of finding different ways to remind people that you love them. Yeah, I've got lots of like little ways that I hopefully do that. And like one of, one of my friends, I don't really see that much, but we do, it's sort of, I mean, God, if we collated all this footage, it would take up hours. But we do a video, like we sort of, we video message each other all throughout the day, most days. Oh, wow. So I'll get her lying in bed with her glasses on chatting to me. And then I'll send her one when I'm making the kids breakfast. And I love seeing her at all these, and then she's out having a walk. And I'll send one back when I'm sat in the car outside the school about to go and get the kids. And we sort of see each other's day, but we're not together. Aww. And it's on our watch because we can reply whenever we want. But I feel like I'm still having a great chat with her and that I'm, I understand how her day is planning out. Mm. So, and, and you know, she's, she's got a kid, so she gets it, I get it, and we're both cool with that. And then another of my friends, Donna, who's got kids who are, well, she's actually a grandma, she's got kids who are older. She's really taught me the importance of boundaries with friendships. And she'll always say to me, if she's asking me of something, she'll say, have I crossed the boundary? And I'll be like, no. Or she'll go to me, you know, tell me what your boundary is with this. Like, oh, wow. do you want to see me or do you really not? And I'll be fine with either. And we're quite sort of explicit. In, but can it, you say, I yeah. actually don't want to see you? I think we've got to a good place where I can go, you know what, I'm so exhausted. And I know that if I don't go to bed really early and just read on my own, I'm not going to feel great mentally. Mm. And, you know, she's a very wise and amazing person who's like... Great, cool. Well done on making a good decision for yourself. You know, mm. you've got to have a pretty special person to have yeah, that that's dynamic. Yeah, very secure person as very, well. Very, very. Mm. But there are lots of them out there. I think you just have to have that conversation. Like one of my friends, Lucy, who's in my old school gang, I think we'd both cancelled doing something and she went, I think it was her sister had said to her, you know the best type of friends? The ones that cancel. Because sometimes you just go, oh, I'm so relieved. Yeah, and also when, when they know that you're happy and then you feel that, yeah. It, but it was so fascinating to me because you seem to be so good at sustaining friendships and they do come up a lot in, in your work all the time. But then you said you used to have this thing where you would worry, like you'd seen a friend and you'd be like, am I not interesting enough? Do they really want to see me? And mm. I wonder where you think that came came from and I think a lot of us can feel that with different people but um I hadn't heard somebody talk about it in that way yeah I mean I probably have it much less today I, I can't think that I've had it recently but certainly all throughout my 20s most of my 30s until again the last two years when I've done a lot of work and you know the sort of writing of this book has made me really dig deep with it but I used to come away from so it was with my old school friends who I've talked about today. And I'd think, do they just think I'm just an absolute twat? Like, because this is the job that I do. And I just feel like, are they, do they just think I'm an idiot and I'm clueless? Or I could be out with someone um, 
who I really respected and think, God, they probably just think I'm so stupid. Like I would have this very negative narrative mm. constantly going on in my head. Um, and I, I don't have it so much. And I think it is because, again, it could be a cliche of turning 40. I don't know what it is, but I'm much more willing to walk away and go, I hope I made them feel good and not worry about, should I have said this? Was that a weird thing to say? I hope that I've left them feeling loved and happy. Mm. And that's all I can really wish for. And it is, I think, much more feeling rather than the intricacies of what you've said or didn't say or whatever. And, I, and I'm much more honest now. If I walk away and go, oh, I, I think I said something a bit weird there, I'll just text and go, I, I hope you didn't take this out of context. Was this a weird, I would never want to upset you. And I will sort of highlight it rather than fest, let it fester in my head. Yeah. So I think that combined with just sort of not worrying so much it has sort of helped, I guess. Mm. I think with this friendship, it's when you can just f keep finding ways to be vulnerable and really honest and yeah, say the like, awkward great. thing out loud is how you get closer anyway. Yeah, it's really good. Um, so that's friendship. But then, I mean, I guess selfishly, I'm interested in this of, as you know, have a toddler now. And I've been looking at like how love's challenges have changed. And I was obsessed with romantic love, like you were saying when you were younger. And I couldn't imagine a time when I didn't put that on a pedestal. Mm. And now my younger self would not believe that romantic love is the thing that sort of can slip to the bottom of my list. Um, and not just that, also finding times when like, I resent my husband and we're like competing over who slept less or we just haven't had a conversation. <laughs> I do yet. that all the like, time. We're like, this is the co this is a fight. Like, no, we're both going to lose. <laughs> and or, or we're just fine. We haven't talked about anything other than our kid for so long. I'm like, hang on a second here. Mm -hmm. Actually, I need to put, put this back in the priority list or at least somewhere. Yeah. And I wonder, you're sort of eight years ahead of me, kids wise, if what you've learned about like sustaining romantic love amidst... Yeah, I mean, I think we have a real good understanding because we talk about this subject. You know, Jesse's luckily very open. I can sit and have a great chat with him about any of this stuff. And we are at a sort of place where we, we know that it's not the same as the night we met in Ibiza where we were sort of, you know, wide-eyed and... I've seen the photos. So and the photo in the beautiful. silhouetted sort of light and, oh, it's all amazing and drunk on espresso martinis, etc. It's not that. And I... And, we know that like, everyone knows really that's not sustainable. You hope it is at the start, like, oh, like, I'm always going to feel like I, can, I just want to get drunk every night and be wild. And it's like, that would become so boring. And uh, it's also quite exhausting, romantic love, because it's, you're all in, every bit of you. Like, I remember when I first met Jesse, and it lasts for a good amount of time, but you'll go to work and all you're thinking about is them. Mm. And then you'll go for a swim and all you're thinking about is that it takes up every ounce of energy I that exhausts me even thinking about it because it, it does but for me it's very obsessional that sort of romantic love yeah so I think where we're at now which I'm so grateful for is we are great friends who love each other so much luckily still really fancy each other as well but the fancying bit doesn't have to be sort of portrayed relentlessly and we just kind of know it's a given even when both of us are knackered and hate each other because we hate each other on was it Sunday, like you arguing about who'd slept less. I think it's one... not even arguing. It's like oh, I didn't sleep. I was like, we didn't. oh no, this you was were... arguing. Oh, okay. This was arguing. This was straight up arguing <laughs> about who had slept less and being real sort of like a real martyrdom with it and just being grouchy and whatnot. And you know, and we sort of do then laugh about it. Like I think it was even Sunday night. We were like, I was like. I said, did I say I hated you at one point? He's like, yeah. I was like, I really take that back. That was very childish <laughs> to say that out loud. I should have just thought it in my head. But we can always get back to a place where we're in this together. We're in the parenting thing together as a team. It's not all going to be sunshine every day. And it's not going to be romantic every day. I think probably Jesse found that one harder because he would probably like more romance. And we do need to actually work harder at it than we are at the moment because work's been probably like too busy for me and Jesse's had a tough couple of years because he's a musician and there hasn't been as many gigs but he's now everything's firing back up and we haven't gone wait a minute when we're doing like who's buying the bananas and who's taking the cat to the vet where's the Fern and Jesse go on like a nice dinner date we haven't done that and I I need that I love there being a marker of you were just a couple in a restaurant and we really don't do that enough what I've learned is just saying it out loud. Like, for instance, 
when I just had a baby and my husband was at work because I'm on paternity, I was, on, I was on maternity, I was like, I resent the fact that you get to leave the house and I don't, and that's not your fault, but it's actually I'm resenting some bigger system that means it's not you, the person, and actually then he would say, yeah, I totally get that, I wish I could do something, but also I really miss our baby, I feel like I don't see, and I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I think I would feel really sad that I Mm. not here and miss her so it's just finding a way to like just keep seeing the other person's perspective when you feel so pissed off and like it's righteous. hard yeah but you know you've touched on there like there are sort of historic systemic things at play which feed into a heterosexual marriage which th those things still stand and sometimes I'll be working more but probably still doing more housework and doing equal amounts of stuff with the kids and I can feel resentment coming up and it's it might sometimes get misdirected to Jesse, but it's not. It's about the system that is in place because we're mm. only a few generations in or maybe even only two generations in to women that can have a family and also have a career. You know, like my mum had jobs. She didn't love them, but it wasn't her career. She was doing like three jobs at any one time. It's, I guess, you know, that was very challenging in itself. But now we're sort of, we're being seen to be given the opportunity to have a career and a family. It's so hard. Yeah. And it's so hard to get the balance within a partnership of yeah. doing that. No matter whether you're heterosexual or not, there is a partnership at play. And you've got to work out how it works. Who does what bit? Who does what role? And whoever gets the first three months has the roughest ride, I think. It's full on. It's full on. I also wanted to ask, thinking of Donna again, something that she said, which I was thinking about a lot, was that it it was all about, like, the, the work that you were doing and thinking of love was about knowing that you'll be okay even in your not okayness. And I guess that section is really about embracing the joy and the pain of life and, yeah. and the love and the loss. And I wonder how sort of thinking about that more, not trying to avoid one and sort of maybe not dreading it and... and being more peaceful, I guess, is a word about it, how that's changed how you deal with loss or how you deal with just lack of self-love or love not going your way. Well, I think it's, it's definitely changed from not writing the book, but it's definitely changed with age. So in my 20s, for instance, if I had been dumped, which honestly, I was dumped way too many times. Oh, like, I was dumped. So I don't think I, I think I only dumped one person once. I don't know if I dumped anyone. <laughs> I can't even recall. I was dumped so many times. It's like, What's going on here? Why do I keep... There must be something really wrong here. Like, what's going on? But every time I would retreat into my shell and just think, oh, I'm awful, I didn't feel okay. Whereas, you know, incrementally through experience, but also having it hammered home by Donna, who not only wrote so brilliantly about it in the book, but I talk to Donna every day. She has really taught me that you can be absolutely okay when tough shit's going down you know you mm. can you can be you might not feel it you might feel like the world is ending you might feel totally untethered from your own life but you you can still cultivate this space of I'm, I'm all right I'm okay and it might not be instant you know it might not be instant I think certainly when you're looking at like sort of mental health problems and when I had a period of depression myself, I didn't feel okay at the time. But I think as I was moving through it, there were these ups and downs where I'd go, you know, this is really hard, but actually I'm sort of all right. Like I'm okay, I'm functioning, I'm getting through, I'm okay on a very sort of practical level at times. But now I think if stuff's happening and I'm uncomfortable, you know, like say if I bring panic attacks into the equation, which I still have, I had a panic attack on... I can't think what it was, a night last week. So I had this huge day of work I was really nervous about and my heart was racing. I was having these adrenaline surges. And previously I'd go, oh my God, what's wrong with me? This is awful. I'm not like a normal person who can just cope with everyday life. This is so pathetic. I beat myself up. The panic attack would ext extend. Now I've got to a place where I can go, I can be okay in the panic attack. It's still happening. The adrenaline surge, vroom, this is the feeling that I get. But I go, I'm having a panic attack. OK, I've, this has happened loads of times before. I'll feel a bit tired tomorrow. I'll probably still be fine at work and wing my way through it. Let's just let it just let it happen. And you find a sense of okayness in that horrible feeling. So I think, again, it takes practice and I'm nowhere near nailing it. But I, I love just knowing that that exists, that it is possible. 
And do you, it's also looking at the evidence, isn't it? Because I think that if I've got like work stress, I'll be like, well, if I look at the evidence, I've probably figured out it all before or yeah. like anything that bad. I was like, if I look at how I've dealt with that before, I always sort of find a way through. You do. But with the dumping, it's like, this is the end of the world. The end of the world. Don't you feel now, someone said something to me that was really interesting. She was like, it seems so arrogant now that I thought at the time I, kn I knew exactly what I needed. Mm. And actually now, thank God we got dumped by some of those people oh. probably. <laughs> Thank like God I was biggest done by blessing, all of them. Because I would have clung on till the sort of bitter Thank end. And God. Then... And sometimes you even know it's not right, but you're mm. still going, oh, but it's just so romantic and exciting. And no, thank God for all the dumpings. Yeah. Um, and then final question, which is what I will ask everyone, is just what you wish you'd known about love. I wish I'd known about self-love. I wish I'd, knew, I'd, I'd heard that expression. I didn't hear that expression until probably my mid-30s and understood it. So I absolutely thought all self-worth and probably quite a large portion of my identity came from outside opinion, whether it was romantic or otherwise. And I built like very wobbly foundations on life because of that, or foundations for life because of that. And I wish that I'd known I could just like myself as I was. I didn't have to feel lesser than or you know I had a huge um, feeling of insecurity all through my teens and 20s I think sort of coming from very regular working class suburban life and then being in the TV world feeling like I don't really belong here like I need to be more interesting somehow or bring something more to the table or invent some unusual thing about myself because I'm just some average person that comes from the suburbs what am I doing here I didn't realise that I could just be very content and okay with who I was. And I am much more so now, mm. but I didn't know that that was possible back then. So I wish I'd known about self-love. So if you're interested in some of the topics that we've been digging into, um, my book Conversations on Love is out in paperback now. And Fern, your brilliant book is Bigger it's Than out Us now. is out now. Bigger Than Us is out now.